Good morning, everyone. That was great. Good morning. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning. So good to see you guys here out today. Um, uh, as always, I sit there, I was going to say, oh, I'm excited about today's message, but there, is there a message I'm not excited about? I can't, I can't say there is because even as we're going through the evangelism course, um, I, I was showing everybody that every Bible verse, every chapter is an opportunity to see the gospel. And what is the gospel? It's the good news of Jesus Christ on our behalf. And how exciting it is just to know that. Every time we open scripture, we get to see God's face. We get to see heaven. We get to see what is to come versus the temporal of what is. And, and I'm just super excited about that. And yet, nevertheless, we're here in this world, aren't we? We're here in a fallen state world. We are in these bodies which have a sin nature that wars against the, the new spirit that's within us. And yet the Lord says that he's given us power and authority by his spirit to subdue the flesh, to rule over, to bring into captivity it which once owned us. Now you own it. Do you understand the power you have in the Lord God Almighty, who is the God of love? Wherever hate runs amok, and it's running amok, trust me, look at the world. We have authority to bring peace. We have authority to bring light where there's confusion. We have authority to bring love. And yet I see so many relationships in the world struggling, dividing. And, and we know that we have an adversary who seeks to, to divide, to conquer, to split. And it's horrible. And I hate him. And I hope you guys hate him. He's there to ruin your relationships. First and foremost, your relationship with God. Because he knows if I can get you to turn from God, I can destroy all the other relationships you are a part of. And I can isolate you. And I can attack you like never before. You know, the, the lion always goes for the weak, the off on the side. I don't need to go to church. Remember what the Bible says is that, that in the end times, there will be those who forsake the assembling together, divide themselves out. And make themselves vulnerable prey. And so as we're continuing in the book of Ephesians with Paul, he wants to build upon the precepts of what he's already taught in the first three chapters. And remember the first three chapters, one was about grace. And this is my house, is what we said. And then last week we learned that we are planted in Christ. We are new in Christ. We are not of the world anymore. We are no longer our own individual doing what I want to do, when I want to do it, how I want to do it. We're not running amok like sheep that are scattered, all disarrayed, all easily controlled, easily manipulated, and easily destroyed. No, we've been called into the fold of Jesus Christ. We've been called into the ark of the God of love. We've been called and planted in the ground in our dead self, old, and now our rising in our new selves in Jesus Christ. We are new creatures in the Lord God Almighty. And in this new creature part, there's, a, there's growth. I told you guys, we, we planted our garden, we cheat a little bit, we go only to, to um, I can't remember, what's the store? Uh, cobblestone. Cobblestone, I think it's cobblestone over on 104, and they already have the plants already this high, so we don't plant them from seed, so we can go out there and plant late in the year to avoid the frost. But nevertheless, they still need to be cared for. There's a war going on between me and the mosquitoes. I already told you this. And it's, it's begun. The poison ivy's got me. <laughs> and I'm trying to get the poison ivy out and root out. But if I don't do that, those plants will not stand a chance. But there's going to be a war. And my war is to make sure that that plant has a chance to grow. We put a fence around it so the deer can't get in. We got you know, some bug spray. So we're doing our work. But every work, or I should say every grow, every plant that's planted in Christ requires nurturing, requires growth. We're going through the evangelism class, and I said, it's one thing to give somebody the gospel, but they get them rooted in a sound Bible teaching church. Because without that, they're going to be destroyed. They will be attacked. And we know the, 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 the parable of the sower, where the, 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 the plants, uh, the, the affairs of the world will strangle them out. The seed will come and Satan will come in quickly and swoop the seed away. And I'm here to tell you, I want to get a focus. And as we get the focus, I'm seeing, I'm seeing relationships just be decimated. <coughs> Maybe whether it's church relationships, whether it's family relationships, whether it's, um, and, and in some cases we're going to see that it, that it may be okay. 
but not marriages. Not marriages. Those are supposed to be, if it's a godly marriage, to be one in Christ. And so as we look at this, I want you to take some precepts away from this. They're going to help you and hopefully wake you up with your relationship. Whatever, whatever relationship that is. Where Satan's trying to get in and cause division. Let's unite in God. And Paul's building on these precepts, as I said. And what you're going to see here is he's looking for a oneness. He's looking for a unity. It says in verse 1 of chapter 4, I therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you, that you walk worthy of the vocation wherein you are called. What is the first thing he's saying here is it's, there's this call of being a prisoner. We all are called out of the world who were once owned by the lusts of our flesh, by the seeds and the character of Satan who we, literally we were born in. We were called by our own agendas and we were encapsulated by those. Whatever they were, whatever you had a passion for, it was a passion for something that was always bringing death into your life. And some of us who've come to the Lord, most, as a matter of fact, I'd say everyone who's come to the Lord, realize this thing was destroying me. And it owned me. And I was a slave to it. And yet now, Paul, remember, who's already in prison in Rome, willingly, cho choosing to be, is writing these books to all the churches, doing some of his greatest works while in prison, to who? Who ultimately is his prison? It's not the Romans. It's Christ. He's a willing bond servant for the glory of God Almighty to penetrate deep into the darkness of this evil world that seeks to destroy people with a message of hope, with a message of love, with a message of assurance, with a message of peace, with a message of eternal gratitude and gratefulness to the Lord God Almighty, who now we are one with. And there's nothing that would stop him from doing this. He's a slave to it. And it continues on and it says that, that I beseech you. That word can mean beg. It can literally mean I beg you. But it also is an exhortation. I warn you. You can say he's on his knees saying I warn you. You started well. I'm warning you, he says. I'm warning you that you walk worthy of of the vocation of which you're called. I think sometimes the interpreters of the Bible there in the King James, they, they didn't want to be redundant, so they didn't say, I, I um, want you to walk worthy of the calling of wherewith you were called, but that literally is what it means. You've been called out of darkness. Your vocation is a new creature in Christ. You've been called and given a new identity. You must be born again. You now are a child of God. Walk worthy of being a child of God. Don't walk how you once walked. In rags, you've been called to riches. Riches unspeakable. You are royalty. My sister is in town, and she has this little dog. It's a Shih Tzu. And, and we were at her birthday party yesterday. I was hoping she'd be here today. But, but anyways, we were there, and we were watching this dog run around. And this dog, its head, it, it literally looked like an alien, first of all. It's like two-inch legs, and it's got this neck that's like six inches, and then a head at the top of it that's just very regal. And it walks around like this, it's like pr pr prancing around, and it doesn't want to be touched. It don't talk to me like a princess. I am the queen. And, and, I, and I think it kind of gets it. <laughs> not that we're to walk haughty. I'm not saying we should be walking with our noses up. As a matter of fact, the Lord says he hates that, right? Proverbs chapter 6, six things that the Lord hates, seven is an abomination in the haughty spirit. This is quite the contrary. I'm not threatened by you, world. I'm not intimidated by you. I'm no longer your subject, but I am called above the sin of the world. I'm not to be party to it. I'm not to look like it anymore. I'm to be different, set apart, peculiar, sanctified. Walk worthy. Not once the things that you once were. Such were some of you, the Bible says. Not such are some of you. Such were some of you drunk in revelry. All these things that it talks about. Fighting, wars. No, that's not who I am anymore. It's who I was. I want you to keep this in mind when you're in the fights with your marriage. When you're in the fights with people around you. Such were some of you. It's not who you are now. This is not who we are. And I warn you, I beg you, remember the vocation, the calling in which you are called. 
Verse 2 goes on and says, With all loneliness and meekness, with long suffering, forbearing one another in love. You know, humbleness is like a swear word to most people in the world. Humble yourself. No! Puff yourself up. Look in the mirror and give your affirmations for the day. I'm good, I'm beautiful, and I'm like <laughs> Paul Smiley or whatever his name was. I don't know. Yeah, 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 exactly. And, and this is what you're supposed to do every morning and then go out and start walking around like you're something. And, and I, I'm watching, I'm stuck, on, I'm stuck on YouTube, I can't help it, I'm addicted to watching certain things, but America's Got Talent, it, 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 it's just, I don't know, it, I love to see the gifting of people, just seeing what God's equipped them with, and, and surprisingly, people who you would never expect, you know, you look at their face, and you're like, you know, so something bellows out of them, like this one girl who's like 12 years old and starts singing some rocks, I'm like, whoa, what was that? And, and, and then, I'm, but I'm watching the ones that were, that, that said, I think it said Simon Cowell hates. <laughs> and they come in and they're haughty. And they're completely arrogant. And you're thinking, boy, this must have this person must have something to show because of the way they're they're talking, the way they're acting. There must be something. This guy's all that or this girl's all that. And then they start to sing. And you're like, oh, I sing better than that. And I'm horrible. I'm a shower singer. I sing solo. I sing solo, no one can hear me as much as I can. But no, these guys are bad. They can't hold a tone. I mean, it, it takes work to sing that bad. And, and I'm thinking, why are they thinking they're all that? Who's telling them they're all that? Who's puffing their heads up to get them so deceived that they're not ashamed to come up in front of everybody and act like that? And they really think they're all that. I can tell you who it is. The devil. He gets us in our relationships and he starts to make us think we're greater than we are. Did, you know, God just doesn't want you to be like him. He doesn't want you to know good and evil. Isn't this the original sin? Telling you to lie? Making you want to be something you're not? Instead of making you something that much better than you could ever be? Through humility? Humility is the key. Humility is the key to enter into, to have a teachable spirit. To recognize fault. To recognize sin for sin and good for good. Humility is the key to come before and say, I'm wrong, I need to know more. Humility is the key that says, I can never know it all. I need more. I'm, every day, I need to see more. My perspective is not the only perspective. There are many perspectives. And, and, and humility is what finally gets us to the place where we receive the beginning of the gospel, which is sin. I'm a sin creature. I'm at fault. When you're in an argument with your significant other, are you humbling yourself and saying, I may not see their side. I don't see everything. Maybe they have something right here that I need to kind of couple with. Is it right in God's eyes? Humbleness and humility. Philippians chapter 2 verse 1 says, If there be any consolation in Christ, if there be any comfort of love, if any fellowship of the Spirit, if any bowels of mercy, fulfill ye my joy that you be like-minded, having the same love, being one accord and one mind. Let nothing be done through strife or vain glory, but in all lowliness of mind teach each, each to esteem the other better than themselves. Look not every man on his own things, but every man also to the things of others. Let this mind be in you which is in Christ Jesus. He came to serve, not to be served. He came to make you better. You who were an enemy to God. He came to make you a friend of God. To align you with truth. To align you with righteousness. But to serve you in that capacity. To minister to you. Continuing on it says, But made himself of no reputation to look upon him in the form of a servant, and was made in likeness of men. And being found in the fashion as man, he humbled himself and became obedient even unto death on the cross. Wherefore God also hath highly exalted him and given him a name which is above every name, that in the name of Jesus every knee should bow of the things of heaven and the things of earth and the things, of, and the things under earth. And so we think of this and we think, what's my purpose in my relationships? What is my purpose here on this earth? 
If I am called into Christ, am I not to be Christ-like? Am I not to be a Christian, Christ-like? Should I not represent what my newness or my vocation is now in that calling? Matthew chapter 20, verse 28 says, Even as the Son of Man came not to minister or to serve, again, King James thing, minister, but to be, but to, not to be minister, but to minister, and to give his life a ransom for many. Here's my problem I'm seeing all around. Even in the church, even with the people who are supposed to be called unto God, there's no passion or commitment to the newness of life that they are in Christ. There is no more humility. There's still a false humility that comes in and Satan's puffed them up or propped them up to a certain extent. And in that <coughs> humility comes a blindness. In that humility comes a, a, a deception. Listen, why would the Lord warn and say, I hate lukewarm. I'd rather you be hot or cold. But because you're lukewarm, you have one foot in the newness of life and the one foot in the old, I want to spew you out. It's gut-wrenching. It hurts. What are you doing? It's shameful. And when we get into our arguments, do not, does not the flesh start to rear up? It says, where do wars come from? Do they not come from the lust within? They were to be crucified with Christ. But why are we fighting to be right? Not esteeming the other greater than ourselves. Not there to serve and minister and to bring alongside in the grace and the love of God Almighty. Listen, Proverbs chapter 16 is a great warning or a beseeching to each and every one of us. Verse 18 says, Pride goeth before destruction and a haughty spirit before fall. Better it is to be humble in spirit with, lowly, with the lowly than to divide the spoil with the proud. Such wisdom. But those that have, those that have obtained, it's so hard for them to let go. That degree I got, that job I have, this house I have, do you see what I've accomplished? Do you see what I've done? Can you hear me? I don't know why, but it just came into my head. I am a woman, hear me roar. It just popped into my head. But, but isn't this how it can be? We start to esteem ourselves greater than we are, and we don't humble ourselves to the order of what God has called, and therefore, what happens? Division happens. Division happens. War happens. Fall happens. We're blind again. In our relationships, we have to be so humble. In our walk with God, we have to be so humble. We're in a world that is so self-consumed, so prideful, so arrogant, so haughty. And it's all around us. And the temptation's there. And it's strangling out your walk with Christ. It's strangling out your unity with God. It's strangling out the love he's called you to portray to the world to be that example. It's stopping you. The Bible tells us that love bears all things. When you're in the midst of it, you're able to endure. The Bible goes on here in, in chapter 4, verse 3 of Ephesians and says, Endeavor to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. Endeavor, endeavor means an action. Well, God's got this. And, and, and even as I just preached the class about giving the gospel out, it's God, it's not you, it's his power. It is his power. You're thinking, I can't do this. You don't know this man. You don't know this woman. Man, they're pushing all the right buttons. I got an ambush. It's always an ambush. Satan will leave for a season. When you resist him, he will leave for a season. But he never rests. He knows his time is short. Are you walking like your time is short? Or are you walking with authority in Jesus now? Redeeming the time for today. Why are you so desperate to win the argument that God could win in the next week or so? Wait on the Lord. Sometimes, most arguments wouldn't happen if people would just Zip it and listen. They're not necessarily speaking different languages. They just aren't listening. They're not hearing because maybe they're saying it's the way someone speaks. Listen, I speak reverse. I have dyslexia a lot of times. So a lot of times when I see people write things, I'll write the first part of the sentence before the last part of the sentence, which most people would do. 
So what happens? Well, I start with what they think is the end. So they interrupt. But that wasn't what my intent was. I wasn't done. I didn't finish. Hear them out. Be quick to hear and slow to speak, the Bible says. Amen? We need to bear all things, but in order to do that, we need to listen and humble ourselves and see what God's doing through that person who's with you. Especially if it's a church. Especially if it's a Bible, a, a, a Christian, someone who's proclaiming Christ as their Lord. There's something special in each and every one of us that we can miss if we don't listen and we think we're something better than we are. Galatians chapter 6, verse 2 says, Bear one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. We talked about this in the men's fellowship on Saturday. For if a man think himself to be something when he is nothing, then he deceives himself. Even our best works can be filthy rags. We can do a whole lot of things and a whole lot of damage and win the war. I mean, sorry, win the battle, but lose the war. This, the battle belongs to God, and we need to enter into the oneness. We need to strive for that unity. Let's persevere to look past what's being portrayed and see in the spirit of what really is in a situation where there's a war, or there's an argument, or there's heated stuff going on. We want to endeavor to keep the peace, as he said. This is an endeavoring. It's an effort thing. It's a constant battle until the day God takes us home. That there will be a war against the flesh and a war against the spirit. There, we already know that, it's, that, there, that, that our struggle is not against the flesh, but in the heavenly realms. We talked a little bit about the spiritual battle that's going on with angels and how they're, they're being held up by the devil um, to get us messages and how the Lord uses creative beings to give this message. He uses fallible beings to give the message even though he can speak directly to people. He's using you. And there's going to be resistance. If the, if the devil came against another archangel and war with him to get the message, won't he come against you, a created being? And yet, who is he coming against? Is it you? If it is, you're going to lose. You're going to fail. You're going to fail miserably. Rather than being a minister, as Christ says he is, you're going to be a minister of Satan. You're going to harm people more than you help them. You're going to put down your spouse, or put down your husband, or put down your church, or put down you name it. Rather than encourage, and build up, and strengthen where they're weak. God says he uses our weaknesses to show himself strong. So are you looking where you can inject God into every situation? Respect, love. Endeavor is a continual thing. Verse Matthew chapter 5, verse 9 says, Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the children of God. Blessed are the peacemakers. He says that he's come, to, he, that, that, that when we celebrate Christmas, that peace is coming to the earth. They, change, they sing this. We all say this, right? What is the peace? The peace is not necessarily between men and men and women and women. Matter of fact, we're going to talk about this in just a second. The peace is with you and God. I am not trying to win a battle or make peace necessarily with my brothers and sisters. What I'm trying to do is make sure that they're at peace with God. There's a big difference. One will cause a lot of compromise. Charles Sturgeon focused on this message, and as he's going through this message, he started to focus on what it's not, what it doesn't mean. And I think that's okay. Although I try not to expand outside of where the scriptures are, but I think it's important to see the negative of this. When I make a piece what it's not, it's, it's, um, I do not like the, uh, doing that too often, but it is, it is critical that we know for certain we are not in unity or making peace with darkness, with sin of what we once were. I'm not at peace with the, the one I killed, the old Gary. I'm not making a, an accord with the world that's in darkness or wickedness. No, not at all. Misery likes company, and it's going to want to brag, bring, bring you into that. But that's not what I've come to do. I've come to help you have peace with God at all costs. And to keep my peace with God that surpasses all understanding. We've been called out to be set apart, sanctified, something different from the world that they are striving for, that deep within their soul they know they need. They know they need to turn. They know they need love. God's love. 
It's an essential part of us just as much as food, just as much as breathing. We need the love of God to live. We are here to bring that, not to love the world, but to show them the love of God. We've been called out or separated or unified to be in God, to be with God. We are not robots or clones, though. We're not all to be the same. And because of that, we have unique differences in skills and, and traits as a woman, as a man, as husbands, as wives, as church people within the church, as people within other relationships. Each person has something extremely valuable that you may not see because it's not you. Because you're a part of the body. Are you respecting the differences that you have when it comes to the giftings? If you're not, I say you're foolish. Because God's put these people in your path to help you. The wife is called a help meet. Sometimes we say it's a hate meet. <laughs> this is what we can think of you get, when Satan gets in there and starts twisting it. Instead of you honoring and cherishing one another and giving respect to one another and saying, wow, I can't believe you saw that. I never saw that coming. Yeah, because you don't have eyes in the back of your head and I'm watching your back. Are you stabbing the one who's watching your back that you're accountable to, that you're in battle with? Are you in the fox, you know, hole, shooting the person who's there with you against the darkness of this world and therefore making enemies? And Satan's laughing all the way. We're not to be robots. We're, we're uniquely made, fitting together and, and perfectly together. Marriage is a perfect representation, or is supposed to be a perfect representation of this, of our unity with Christ Jesus. Both the husband and the wife are joined as one, yet they are also complete individuals. Parts coming together perfectly. Their, their mission and purpose in Christ remains constant and unwavering, yet their passion and gifting are completely different. Complementary, and they should look at each other as such. It's a benefit. It's a good. It's not a bad. It helps me. Step beyond mine. And verse 4 goes on and says in, in chapter 4, it says, There is one body and one spirit, even as you are called into one hope of our calling. There is, in fact, um, still there is the fact that we've been brought or bought by the blood of Jesus Christ and thus have entered into his being. We already said this. He literally is the ark that we have entered in to avoid the wrath of God which once came by water through Noah, but now is going to be fired upon all damnation, upon all evil. God is, Jesus says, you think I've come to bring peace, but I've come to bring a divide between me and the world and the wickedness, between light and darkness, between life and death. I've come to bring oneness in life, though, and Satan wants to divide the life. Satan wants to divide those on the boat who are in Christ. And I submit to you that's impossible if you're in Christ. If your eyes are fixed upon the Lord and his love for you, you're compelled to become a servant to those around you. You're compelled. You cannot stay in darkness. You run back to the light. You see the, the wretchedness of it, which is why you ran to Christ to begin with. And if you see that in someone else, Who's around you? Should you not minister as you've been ministered to by Christ? Is, is he not leaving the 99 and picking you up and bringing you back again and again and again? Has he forgiven you once or has he forgiven you for all sin? And if it says if he died for you while you were a sinner, how much more now that you're saved? Where sin abounds, grace abounds all the more. If he's pouring this love upon you, are you letting it grow in you? Are you letting it become you? Are you to the point where you're ready to give that grace to all those around you? The Bible says when you're filled, or be you continually filled with the Spirit of God, that it also goes on and says that out of your belly shall flow torrents of living water. For who? For the world. For others. That you would be able to be God here on this earth to minister to others. And it starts in the home. If it ain't happening there... It ain't happening out. This is the proving ground. This is unfortunately where it really happens. You know, people rub shoulders and the realness of them comes out. 
And the realness of having to die to self comes out to crucify the flesh. We were bought with a price. We've been reconciled our debt by the blood of Jesus Christ. And thus we've entered into his being, into his, in him we move, we live, we have our very being. We are Christ. We are in Christ here on this earth. To live is Christ, to die is gain, Paul said. We are literally Christ. Remember when he says that, that where sin abounds, grace all the more. But then he says, should I then join Christ with a harlot? Should I then bring him into the darkness of what I once was or what the world envelops itself in? No. And can we do that? Okay, you don't physically do that. You don't physically murder. You don't physically, you know, have adulterous affairs. You don't physically, but are you spiritually? When you're in the middle of the argument, do you have raka? Death to my brother. Is it still there in your heart? And if so, should we repent? Should we turn from it and look to God? And say, forgive me, Father. Renew in me a right spirit. Give me a right heart. Let your blood flow through me. Bring unity where only you can. There's one Lord, one faith, one baptism. It continues on to say. This doesn't mean there aren't many parts, there aren't many churches that are ministering to many people, but the core message is the same and should be. It should be about Jesus. There should be no shame for the name of Jesus. It should be the profession of Christ and the oneness in him, who is the flock of God, who is the bride of Christ. We're not Frankenstein. We're in unity. And marriages sometimes can look like Frankenstein, can't they? It's like, are you guys married? <laughs> and then the world will mock them. Oh, yeah, it's great, you know? The stupid husband. And, the da -da 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 -da. and, they, and they antagonize us and encourage us because what are they empowered by? Satan. He wants you to disrespect your husband. He wants you to disrespect your wife. He wants you to disrespect the joy and the peace that comes from when you walk in unity in Christ. He wants to mock God. And he wants to destroy you. But we're supposed to be in one God. You know, there's one God. We, there's, there's some debates here, you know, about the Trinity. It, listen, there's only one title God. There's three persons of God. God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit, and yet one God. There's one God we've been called into. There's one Father which is in heaven, and that one Father is whom we've been reconciled unto through the Lord Jesus Christ, that we can come boldly and ask anything in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and it shall be given unto you, even the power to love around you. And there's one baptism, not next week, but the week after. We will be doing a baptism outside. This is talking about a spiritual baptism. And if you've been spiritually baptized, entered in, unified by Christ, given an engagement ring, reconciled to the Lord because of the union that you've been drawn unto God in, then be water baptized too, as obedience to God in oneness, showing the world that you're one with God. This is what this is, this is talking about. Is there's division in the church, and Paul's just hitting it right home. Get rid of this division. We are warriors for Christ. We're one body. We need to get out there and do the mission of God. And it's not going to happen if we're walking divided. Frankenstein. One God, one Father of all, who is above all, and through all, and in all. But to every one of us is given grace according to the measure of the gift of Christ. We fail... You're going to fail in your relationships, but how do we persevere? How do we get better? We walk in the grace. Grace is not there to give you an entitlement to sin. Grace is there to give you victory when you sin. Do you understand the difference? I don't, I don't use my liberty for an occasion of sin. Grace is not giving me the liberty to continue in divisive ways, in my own way, to go back to who I was. Grace is what happens when I fall, and he gives you a lift up. To put you back on track. Back in unity. No matter how many times you fall, he's there to pick you up. Again and again and again. Praise be to God. But he's not there to turn a blind eye to sin. He says, what you sow, you shall reap. God is not mocked. So if you're sowing into your relationship divisiveness, argumentativeness, rightness, pureness, haughtiness, well, what do you think you're growing and it may not happen right away. Those seeds can take a while to come up to the surface. Don't be shocked when it all of a sudden happens and you start to get strangled. Just get back to humility and let the Lord clean the garden. 
and start planting those seeds, which are good, righteous. But unto every one of us is given grace according to the measure. So no matter what we've done, there's always enough grace. Always enough to keep us in the unity with God. Wherefore he saith, when he ascends on, on high, he led captivity captive and gave gifts unto men. Now he has ascended that it is, I'm sorry, what is but that he also descended first into lower parts of the earth. He that is descended is the same that also ascended far above in heavens, and he that he might fulfill all things. So knowing that the Lord is fulfilling the scriptures according to the plans that the Father has said, how much more should we then enter into the plan that he's fulfilled and do the plan? To be ministers wherever it is, first in your own home, then to your neighbor, then, you know, obviously in our church. Serve. Be a part of it. But it's one has come down from heaven as commanded by God and risen up so that we can then be lifted up. When you humble yourself, he will lift you up. Guaranteed. Always. You can never go wrong with humbling yourself in the sight of the Lord. That doesn't mean not be strong against sin. It just means humble yourself and let God have the battle. Don't be the one who has to win the battle all the time. Matter of fact, if you've won, you most likely have lost. And Satan's laughing. Be careful. And he gave some to be apostles, and some prophets, and some evangelists, and some pastors, and some teachers. For what, though? Why do you have this? So you can puff yourself up and say, Whoa, look what an expositor I am. Look at the Hebrew and the Greek that I know, and I see it all the time. We went to a, a, a wedding. I, I told you, I think I mentioned it in this service. Uh, that was a non-Christian wedding. And, and um, the sister got up, and the sister said a prayer. And she was trying to bring her Christianity into it. And it was actually a great prayer. Except she closed it with, in his name. And I'm like, whose name? I said, Jesus. <laughs> I'm not ashamed of Jesus. I am identified with Christ. And the name of Christ is the power over all things. I'm okay with bringing Jesus into every facet of my life I want. Because I'm in him. And he can have it all. But it's also that, that I don't sit there. There was a guy who came who was part of the Catholic Church. And he was... The diocese or something has been in forever, and he, he just comes aside and starts talking to Arena and I out of, out of the blue. We all start talking, and, and I said, yeah, I'm a pastor, and, and then he starts talking. He's okay with that, but then I said, yeah, what I learned is I was raised Catholic, and, and I was raised you know, in many religions. I said, but what I learned is the simplicity of the, of the gospel through the word of God. And how the word of God says it all. And then the conversation just, he was like, okay, got to get out of here. Why? Because he's taught that there's catechisms. He's taught that the Pope is God on earth. He's taught that there's more to it. No, there, I don't need more than Jesus. I don't need more than the words that have been inspired by the Holy Spirit to men that have been written down and kept perfect throughout history. I don't need religion. Man-made religion and rules and rituals put upon. Are you doing that in your relationship? Are you bringing these in your relationship? Where you can rule over people? Your wife? Lord over them? Where the Lord says, don't lord over them? Are you serving them with the love and letting it live out? Or are you bringing in? Ooh, as soon as I bring the word of God and ministers so graciously and does cut right asunder to the ball. Then it's no longer me against my wife. Let's see what God says about this, honey. Let's let him rule our relationship. What's the truth being spoken of right here? And we each have been given different gifts with regards to that. Each one of us has a special gifting. And we need to respect that gifting. And we're tightly knitted together. It says, why do we have these? It's for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body. We're to build up each other, encourage each other, strengthen each other, equip each other for the ministry of the Lord. Till we, are all, till we all come into the unity of faith and the knowledge of the Son of God unto the perfect man, unto the measure, stature, the fullness of Christ. What does this mean? I can go back to Charles... Uh, Spurgeon. It, we're not there yet. The negative part of this. We are growing in his love. It's not perfected yet in us. So give grace to one another, but let's strive for that perfected love. Amen? May that be our focus. May that be our look, is I want to have the same 
perfect agape love for all those around me. Not just my spouse, not just my wife, not just children, not just my mother, father, not just my coworker, not just my neighbor, but for everyone. May I have this. And I'm not there yet. And thank God for the grace and the measure of grace he's given to each one of us. Let's give it to each other. But let's both be focused on this. I've heard it said before that if you're on two different visions, two different pegs, no matter how hard you try to come together, you know, you take a rope and you dangle it from two pegs on a, on a beam, and no matter how hard you come together, there's always a force pulling you apart. But if Jesus is your peg, and what's been nailed through his hand, and to be as him, and you're both tied to the same cross, the same Christ, the same one God, and you're both striving to please God, to be in God, then no matter how hard your flesh tries to pull apart, the force is pulling you back together. Amen? Fact. You've been gifted differently, but for the same purpose to encourage each other in the love of Christ and the ministry of God. That we henceforth be no more children tossed to and fro, carried about by every wind of doctrine, by slight of men, and by the cunning and craftiness whereby they lie in wait to deceive you. I started this out by saying there's a war. And the deceiver is the, the one who's leading the charge, the devil. He's the father of lies. He's making things seem as though they're not. He's going to, if you don't take time to listen and you don't take time to bring God into the situation, you will be deceived and you will falsely judge all of those around you in a situation. And you won't be an effective minister. Instead, you'll be an, an effective divider. Verse 15 goes on and says, But speaking the truth in love may grow into him all things, which is the head, even Christ and this is the goal, is that we're to grow in the grace and knowledge of Jesus Christ to become more like him, from whom the whole body fitly joined together and compacted by which every joint supplieth according to the effectual working and measure of every part maketh increase of the body unto edifying itself in what? I'm just seeing who's reading and who's not. Love. What? Love. Love. Without love, there is nothing. You may have all the giftings of God Almighty, but the Lord says, if you speak with tongues of angels, and you prophesy, and you do all of these things with the gifting and the knitting that God's equipped you for to show the love of God, what are you? Theologians here. A clanging symbol. You're like that monkey that gets wound up. That's how you are in your relationships. We don't want to be that way. It all has to be encapsulated, held together, and purposeful based on love. Why do I steer clear from sin? Because I love you so much, I don't want to be a bad pastor. Why do you steer yourselves away from pornography, husbands? Because I don't want to be a bad husband. Why do I steer clear from the bottom? Because I need to be sober-minded so that I can see when the deception comes in. I want to be vigilant. I want to be purposeful. I want to be worthy of the vocation of which I've been called. The honor and the privilege of being the wife or the husband or the daughter or the son of God in which I am. I don't want to use my liberty for an occasion of sin. I want to use it to be victorious in the battle that's against that wicked snake, the devil who's out there destroying lives and dividing and conquering people, deceiving them. Amen? Amen. Dear Heavenly Gracious Father, Lord, thank you for your word. Thank you for your mercy. Thank you for your grace. Thank you for your love that overcomes all. Help us, Father, to enter into this and to continue to strive for it and to take action, actionable faith, to walk out of here with a purpose to be different, to be different from the flesh that we once were and to be like Jesus Christ. Continue to do that work which you've done in us. Let us allow it, Lord. Focus our eyes on you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.